They say that Hollywood is a town built on dreams, and one of its greatest dreamers was Walt Disney. Walt believed that any height could be scaled if you knew the secret of making dreams come true. Well, he certainly knew that secret. He touched the hearts of millions of people around the world. The story of Walt's life is truly an amazing one, and no one can tell it better than Walt himself. My dad worked as a carpenter in the world's fire buildings. He eventually ended up in Chicago as a contractor. And he was doing that when I was born. December 5th, 1901. But my dad made some money as a contractor. And he wanted to get back to the farm. They finally ended up buying his farm in Marceline, Missouri. It was a beautiful farm. But it was not the kind of farm to make a living on. Things got pretty tough on the farm. My dad had a sickness. So my dad sold the farm, took the money, and went to Kansas City. And my dad bought this uh, Kansas City Star route. And they gave me a route. I was about nine or ten when I started that. In winter, we'd go out at 3.30 in the morning right after a blizzard or in a blizzard or in pouring rain. It didn't matter. I did that for six years. It was tough. It seems that everywhere Walt's father turned, he found failure. And the constant struggle took its toll on the family. One by one, the children began to leave home. Then came the day Walt woke up to find his best friend, his brother Roy, had gone as well. My brother had joined the uh, Navy, so I wanted to join him. Well, I was still a year too young, I was 16. Finally, this kid come in to me very excited. He said, there's something, something just for me here that you and I can get in. I said, what is it? He says, an ambulance unit. I was in Paris, 3rd of September, and Percy pulled up. Paris, which had been this exciting thing, and all these soldiers and things, suddenly there wasn't a soldier to be seen. And I suddenly became very lonesome. So then I went in and put a request in to be discharged. Well, I hit Chicago, that's where my parents were living, and I said, Dad, I want to be an artist. And my dad, he, uh, he just couldn't buy that. So I pulled stakes and moved to Kansas City. Roy was in Kansas City working at a bank. One of the uh, fellows working with Roy said, say, I have a couple of friends that have an art shop. And I went up with these samples, and there were all these corny things I'd done in France. Well, my gosh, they hired me. I mean, right on the spot. So I took the camera home, and then I started experimenting. Come on, old man. So then I went into this Kansas City film ad company. So that was where I got started in the animation business. So I was thinking if I had something with a novel twist, I might crack the market. But I still couldn't get anywhere with it. I'd failed. I learned a lot out of that. And I think it's I think it's important to have a good hard failure when you're young. I packed all my worldly goods in a cardboard suitcase. I went to Hollywood. Arriving there with just forty dollars in my pocket for my Kansas City ventures. Now my brother Roy was already in Los Angeles. Both of us were unemployed. We solved the problem by going into business for ourselves. We established the first animated cartoon studio in Hollywood. Walt's dream was finally coming true. He had his first commercial success, Oswald the Lucky Rabbit. And Walt himself was lucky enough to marry the girl of his dreams, Lillian, a pretty ink and paint girl who worked at his studio. Then he was dealt a tough blow. On a trip to New York City, he learned that through a contract loophole, he had lost ownership of Oswald. And to make matters worse, the distributor had signed away all of Walt's artists. Devastated, he headed back home to California. But something happened along the way that would change his world forever. Mickey Mouse came into our life. 
popped out of my mind onto a drawing pad on a train ride from Manhattan to Hollywood at a time when the business fortunes of my brother Roy and myself were at lowest ebb and disaster seemed right around the corner. His first actual screen appearance was at the old Colony Theater in New York in Steamboat Willie. He was the first cartoon character to stress personality, and I thought of him from the first as a distinct individual. I did the voice. Hang on, pal. Here we go. <laughs> Mickey was simply a little personality assigned to the purposes of laughter. Mickey fitted the need exactly. He brought in the money which saved the day. He enabled us to explore our medium and he paved the way for our more elaborate screen ventures. By nature, I'm an experimenter, so I had another idea which was plaguing my brain. It was a silly symphonies. It was a series without a central character. Every one of them was a, a new type of subject to give us something to uh, reach out of and accomplish something different. Then we started distributing both Mickey Mouse and the Silly Simpsons. It was nip and talk, get in the mouth. Walt began to push himself and his artists. He worked day and night. And when he wasn't working, he was worrying about the future. And then the inevitable happened. In 1931, he suffered what he called a heck of a breakdown. So he took Lillian on the first vacation they had ever had. By the time he got back, he was a new man and ready to get back to work. I saw the handwriting on the wall there. It was a short subject, it was just a filler on any program. Now if I could crack the feature field, then I could do things. I had done a little story research on different fairy tales I might do, and Snow White was one of them. I thought it was the perfect story. I had the heavy. It's a magic wishing apple. Now, make a wish. I had the prince and the girl, the romance. I had the sympathetic dwarfs and things. We started Snow White sometime late 35, and it was around two years in the making. We had the the family fortune, we had everything wrapped up in Snow White. In fact, the, the banker, I think, was losing more sleep than I was. We had a big premiere, the Carthay Circle Theater, big, grand Hollywood premiere. All of Hollywood brass turned out for a cartoon. The daddy of Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs is going to be presented this beautiful statue. Isn't it bright and shiny? Oh, it's beautiful. Aren't you proud of it, Mr. Disney? Well, I'm so proud, I think I'll bust. <laughs> With the profits of Snow White, I built a studio. Two years later, I was almost broke. <laughs> but I had all these pictures in work. Hello, Joe. You can't see. There are no things on me. Bandy. That was when the war came. The whole world was collapsing then. So many of my boys went to service. So I just practically stopped my feature production. That's all I could do. But after the war, there was quite a problem picking up the pieces. I knew that uh, diversifying of the business would be the, the salvation of it. So I tried various things. I wanted to go beyond the cartoon. And I thought if I could get into the live end, there's things I could do. Stand by engines. Come on, get our boy, get him! Not bad, eh, Charlie? Let's open her up and see what you'll really do. 
And I wanted enough different types of things that I could say I could fall on my nose with one of these pictures, but I had another one right behind it that would hit. After a long concentration on live action and cartoon films, we decided to try something that would employ about every trick we learned in the making of films. We would combine cartoon, live action, in an enormous fantasy, Mary Poppins. As the original Mary Poppins budget of $5 million continued to grow, I never saw a sad face around the studio. Even my brother Roy was happy. This made me nervous. And the horrible thought struck me. Suppose the staff had finally conceded that I knew what I was doing. Once again, Walt Disney reinvented family entertainment, creating many of the classics we still enjoy today. But even then, he wasn't finished. He had a bigger dream in mind. Well, it came about when my daughters were very young, and I, Saturday was always uh, Daddy's Day with the two daughters. So we'd start out and try to go someplace with, you know, different things, and I would take them to the merry-ground, and I took them different places, and. As I'd sit there while they, uh, they rode the merry-ground, did all these things, I felt that there should be something built, some kind of a, an amusement enterprise built where that the parents and the children could uh, have fun together. So that's how Disneyland started. Takes a lot of money to uh, make these dreams come true. Uh, we had everything mortgaged, including my uh, family. Started with many ideas, threw them away, started all over again. And eventually it evolved into what you see today as Disneyland. But it all started from a daddy with two daughters wondering where he could take them, where he could have a little fun with them too. Park means a lot to me in that something will never be finished, something that I can keep developing and adding to. Not only can I add things, but even the trees will keep growing. The thing will get more beautiful every year. And I knew that if I did anything like the park, I had to have some kind of a medium like television to let the people know about it. The world is a carousel of color. History, comedy, fantasy. There's drama and mirth. There's old Mother Earth. With all of her secrets to see The miracle of imagination The marvels of earth, sea, and sky These wonders untold are ours to behold In the funny world, the sunny world The wonderful world of And now your host, Walt Disney. Today, I want to share with you some of our ideas for Disney World. Here in Florida, we have something special we never enjoyed at Disneyland, the blessing of size. There's enough land here to hold all of the ideas and plans we can possibly imagine. Everything in this room may change time and time again as we move ahead. But the basic philosophy of what we're planning for Disney World is going to remain very much as it is right now. We know what our goals are. We know what we hope to accomplish. And believe me, it's the most exciting and challenging assignment we've ever tackled at Walt Disney Productions. Well, after 40 some odd years in the business, my greatest reward, I think, is that I've had the, the public uh, appreciate and accept what I've done all these years. That is a great reward. And I think by this time, uh, my staff, my group of executives are convinced that Walt is right, that, that quality will out. And I think that'll hang on after, uh, after Disney. Walt Disney once said, I hope that we never lose sight of one thing that it was all started by a mouse. But we know it was really all started by a man. A man with a dream. And a mouse. 